Fatima is going to be speaking on clean energy and communities as climate actors, and she will give us examples from Senegal. Fatima Diallo is a constitutional lawyer with more than eight years of experience as international consultant in the field of justice, governance, human rights, transparency, and accountability. She has worked as a legal anthropologist, as a senior, senior researcher at the Faculty of Law of the University of Cape Town, South Africa, working in the field of customary law, indigenous values, and human rights. And she has done extensive research on legal pluralism and indigenous laws and practices in Francophone West Africa and South Africa. And Home Health is very proud to be, able to be partners with uh, Fatima Diallo and our organization, Kradesh, in Senegal. And recently, we, she hosted us just before, before the party, by the close of last year, uh, dialogue with Fisher folks at Kaya in Senegal, who are resisting uh, fossil fuel expansion. Uh, so Fatima, uh, we're happy to have you with us. Please come on and turn on your video and make your presentation. Bonjour, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks to Nemo and to the Homer team for associating me to be debate. I'm really um, glad to see him after some months, at least virtually, and uh, greetings to Stefan as well. And I'm very happy to meet all the colleagues from a different part of the world and to be given this chance to exchange ideas about this, this topic. Um, I, I am a French speaker, as you may guess, so be um, kind with my English. I, I just um, will go and try to present. I did the presentation in English and I might expand more um, with my French, French English. Actually, I call this it's French and English, but I'm sure you will get what I'm, I'm saying. I hope at least. Um, I was um, asked to present on, to talk about communities as a alternative of, um, uh, as climate um, actors. I think just to, to introduce, um, um, as just Nemo said, uh, in most of the African countries, the main debate about clean energy, um, before even you talk about clean energy, people are struggling with energy by itself. Uh, because for many part of in many parts of the continent, energy accessing energy is actually a luxury. Um, I am uh, right now in the north of Senegal, and I can assure you that in many villages, for example, uh, just getting um, electricity during the night is like um, a blessing, not just um, something you you consider as being some normal. Um, um, things in life. Um, we did a tour in a certain number of villages, like uh, seven villages yesterday on, on the Sunday. And many of the, um, the, the news we have from the co communities were celebra celebrating access to water and access to electricity um, in the last um, three years. So they were, communities were absolutely happy about those, those, um, those, those events and it means a lot for them. So it's difficult now in that context, I think for many of our, our government to think, okay, if I have to give uh, communities um, access to energy, how then do I deal or how can I afford clean energy? And I think that speak as well to many of the question that um, Nemo have already raised. I think uh, in many of the part of the continent where the people are seen as poor and, and have a very limited possibilities in their life, we really have been made to believe that energy has become something that someone have to fight to have. And if the government is having it, it can have it by all means. Of course, that's not the narrative that we want to promote because we know where it uh, might end because we have seen what is happening around the world. So um, Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, still remain the most electricity poor region in the world. Um, and we, about half of the population have access to energy. 
clean cooking, for example, is available for only one third of the South Sub-Saharan um, uh, population, and more than 6 billion people uh, lack electricity around the continent. Uh, eight uh, to nine, 890 um, million cook uh, with unhealthy food, like we see our uh, people women's uh, cooking with really very difficult, uh, in very difficult condition. We did see them live in very difficult conditions. So uh, electricity access itself is a problem. So let's not talk about um, a clean energy. And uh, for most African states, just as Nemo was saying in a more theoretical way, access to energy can mean just um, accessing, with, uh, accessing it with dirty energy. Um, and these lead actually in our context to increase extractivism as colonial and post-colonial predation, predation and accelerate negative impacts uh, on climate change. Um, just um, if I take my country um, like Senegal to access to energy, many of the resources we have have been of course hydropower but it has been as well um, uh, in, the, in the recent years, the debate was about accessing it through exploitations of coal. And now in a very, in the, in the last two, three years now is about accessing it through gas and uh, exploitation, the, the gas, the petrol, which we have discovered. Senegal is not known as being a, a mining country. Is not known as a country that is have a lot of natural resources. Uh, we are known with, as we have been in the Francophone um, Africa count, uh, context called as the country of human resources. We don't have natural resources. We do have human resources and very few natural resources compared to most of many of our neighboring um, countries like um, Guinea, uh, like. Um, Cameroon or um, like uh, Ivory Coast or many other countries which have been really seen as being the one who have been blessed with many natural resources. Uh, we used to be a Sahel country. I mean, we are still a Sahel country and the Mauritania desert is just heating and we, we will get back to that in terms of um, impact of climate change. Like over the last, uh, the last week, uh, you can see uh, winds that comes until it cover in the desert of Sahara, it get back to Mauritania until it cover um, half of a car, like your car is packed and half of it is covered by sand and the sand is coming from the desert and, and these are phenomena that we are not used to see. And uh, temperature have been going here up to 46 degree, 50 degree in the, like, during, uh, during the last, last months, uh, in, at least in the north of the country. And uh, in that context of a uh, very extreme uh, climate change impact, you can see uh, still uh, the country being very overwhelmed by increasing the extractivism, meaning extracting natural resources, uh, mostly from the ground and to try to exploit it in order to um, create what they can call development. Although the term development, as Nemo said, can by itself be a very controversial, uh, controversial uh, should be questioned. Um, access to energy just, uh, for many African countries in Africa, generally, um, we, the sources of energy uh, over the years have been mostly natural gas, coal, uh, a bit of coal, uh, hydro and oil, nuclear, and wind is just coming very recently. And that because these are the source of electricity, you can understand as well how extractivism have been promoted. And this system of dirty energy, if we can use the term still, is very unproductive. It's not a system that is productive because across the continent, despite of using those resources to be able to um, provide electricity, till now, first of all, we fail to deliver energy to all. Uh, we can extract all the resources of the Congo Basin or of the um, Central Africa, but we still will see 
endemic energy inequalities. Uh, we don't see, again, the developmental benefit of access to energy, the so-called developmental benefit, because you might extract, uh, produce energy, but still we fail in Africa to see across the continent some of the developmental benefit of energy, despite all the theory. And we are in a context as well where still in Africa, uh, we temperature is raising 1.5 to 2 times higher than the global average. And all these uh, problems lead as well to the increase of poverty with climate hazard, flooding, drought, etc. So that means that the, the system we actually trying or our state are trying to actually promote is not really the system that we need and we see need to rethink it. Of course, uh, we have faced many <laughs> debate on this. It's just like when you talk about African customary law and then you are told, oh, well, what's the, if, you, 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 if you remove um, the formal law, what are you going to put in place? If you remove this unproductive system, what are you proposing? And can we afford what you are proposing? I think at one point we, we have to address those questions and there is no very easy answer to that. Here in Senegal, for example, and this is across basically um, the civil society organizations, uh, there is a very, um, there is no strong movement against, for example, exploitation of oil and gas because uh, people think that there is no alternative. If we need to access to energy, and the government is saying that we can only uh, provide energy by exploiting these natural resources, be it dirty or clean, uh, then you have to provide alternative. Or if you re reject that, you have to give some guidance and solution. And that's where we have to spend a lot of time, I think, to sensitize and explain that actually this system is non-productive and we have to think differently. And even in the civil society, we still see that this debate is still very limited and people are still uh, struggling with identifying those alternatives and especially operationalizing those alternatives. We can uh, bring a lot of theory about those alternatives, but how do you make it operational in our different contexts, in our different country, will remain still a big debate. Uh, still, um, when we talk about the community, which is really what I want to speak about, to position them as being uh, actor, climate actors, we should understand that in the very beginning, many of the time, communities are seen as just being climate victims. So they are affected and impacted um, and seen as passive agent in the context of climate change. Mostly, at least it has been the case in our different countries, especially here in Senegal or generally in Francophone Africa. So communities are those who are expect, um, impacted by flood, they are impacted by, by, by cyclones, they are impacted by many uh, climate change as that, and uh, including the other um, indirect effect, increased poverty, uh, in, a lack of um, access to health system. So they are really, they have been positioned as being just, okay, these are the victims of this problem. And hence, generally, what we see is that they are excluded from international climate neg negotiation. And uh, we work a lot with communities over the, let's say, 15 years. Uh, and um, many of the case is that maybe you will have someone from a civil society speaking out about the concern of the community, but you will rather see like a very prominent leaders or community leaders being taking part of some of the national, in some of the national debate. Let's not talk about the international debate, especially the international climate negotiation that happens around the world. Um, and um, maybe that I, I have the sense that it's a bit different in Latin America and somewhere you have made big coalitions that are now coming from indigenous communities and all. But here, if we look at our communities, they are often just left out of the debate. So they are represented mostly by civil society organization and that's as well sometimes provide with a mixed result. It has, it's, it's something, but it's not enough, uh, we think. So, 
But if we place communities in the main debate of uh, climate change, we see, for example, the importance to, to really consider them as being key in the debate. Why? Because um, worldwide, 30, 100 billion metric tons of carbon is managed by indigenous communities. That is already known uh, through evidence. That's 33 years worth of worldwide emission. In Africa, for example, if you just take the Congo Basin, which actually uh, um, span um, uh, DRC, Republic of Congo, Gabon, Central Africa, Republic Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon, uh, more than 500 million acres um, in the Central Africa, um, which is considered as the second largest reservoir of carbon in terms of, uh, because of its vegetation and, and because it's a very uh, big forest after, the big, biggest forest after the Amazon. Um, it contain to, to 25 to 30 billion tons of carbon, which is worth four years of worldwide emission. And why these figures as impo is important is because those forests, communities live there. They are the one who manage basically on a daily basis the forest. What they do in that those forests have a bigger impact on what can happen in terms of climate change and how really the government or the international actors have to move in terms of managing those big reserves that we think can uh, should be saved. Uh, to save the planet. And if we look at those communities who live in those uh, many of these areas where we still have some big reserve of, of carbon that will can help mitigate uh, in, in a way climate change, uh, the communities that have been living there, at least in Africa, are communities who are used to live in harmony with nature. That goes again on where did we get that development is only sometimes this modern type of development. I think the community who have stayed in forests for a century of years have their own definition of development. And these definitions should give them the whole legitimacy necessary and should as well be respected. And um, those communities have been living with harmony with, in, in harmony with nature because uh, traditionally there is deep religious and spiritual belief than in the, that in between the relationship between human and, and nature. Usually for those communities, it's seen as being a counter nature. Uh, um, situation to be actually destroying the nature. In many of the indigenous communities in South Senegal, for example, I gave the example at the end of the slide, um, the Jola community in Kazamas, it's difficult for them to understand how a human being can actually be destroying nature, destroying our environment, um, digging uh, to extract oil, um, destroying uh, sea, for destroying the, 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 the fish, um, reserve, all those things are seen as some case, um, as um, something that is a sin and not something that is normal. It's really that human beings are being like possessed by some demon, but it can't be seen as something normal. So that's as well uh, things we have to take in mind that yes, in urban society maybe, uh, development have get to a level of understanding where maybe changing it depend. Um, we need a lot of effort, but still in some indigenous communities, development have still a strong sense that is very beneficial for the protection of our environment and that is very beneficial for the protection of nature. And we still have to leave a room to protect those beliefs that can be as well um, beneficial for, 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 for the, the environment. And many communities, for example, sometimes opt to uh, not enter into the development. They opt for no development, let's say, because they will fight against big road. They will fight against uh, sometimes even just introducing electricity of the, in their villages. They will fight against TV and all. And those people will be seen as being non-development. I mean, people who are against development. That's take us as well to the whole realism of and reality of colonialism, neo-colonialism, and delegitimation of everything that can't be unpacked in a very easy way and understood in a very modern, modern way. 
So, uh, and that's lead, I think, uh, to another debate where, for example, you see many of the communities, especially the traditional communities, who are sometimes fighting against um, dirty energy infrastructure. Sometimes you wonder whether they really understand what they are doing, or whether they really understand the whole uh, sophisticated dis discourse around climate change, or they just have a different understanding of what development means, or they don't see these things as being necessary. And I give here an example, I will give in my slide, um, of one of the traditional communities. This is now a showcase, uh, I mean, who is now a showcase across Francophone Africa as being the first one who have fought against um, coal plant and uh, for now we can see maybe in a, in a very um, positive way. Um, just to get back a bit on the context of Senegal, Senegal is one of the most stable democ democracy in Africa, so-called democracy. Um, since, um, they discovered um, oil and gas just in the recent years, as I was saying in the beginning, we are not a country where you will find a lot of natural resources, we, it's not part of our history. Um, uh, in, it is the but still um, it entered in all most of the agreements around uh, extractive industry transparency. It was seen recently as being one of the first African countries who have made strong progress. The ETM um, um, Pan um, assembly happens here in Dakar last year. So many things, uh, despite the new uh, rush uh, to uh, the exploitation of natural resources, many things is is, is happening. Uh, yet in terms of um, climate change, the country itself is as well um, having um, serious issues because um, rainfall is dropping, temperature is, is raising, and um, over the last, um, since independence to now, we haven't seen this going in the, in the, in the best direction you can expect. The, the country is, uh, temperature is getting hotter and hotter, including seawater temperature actually are, are getting hotter. And we see in a, on a daily basis, the impact of climate change. Just for example, in the past, of the, in some part of the north, as I was saying, we have seen over the last weeks, for example, peaks of high temperature and sand uh, crossing the whole river of 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 of, um, of Senegal to actually enter the country. And these phenomena are going to happen uh, uh, again and again if nothing is 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 done. Uh -oh. So in the in the recent years, the the the, the concrete um, meaning of the extractive be, uh, boom is that uh, now thirty six uh, six percent of exportation is from the extractive, so the mining and all, and two point eight percent of the GDP is now from mining. Nine point six uh, of its asset is as well from extractive sector. Uh, uh, again, um, in the from 2021 or to 23, they might have three mega project of oil and gas that have will start in the country. Uh, most of the projects to to start are um, located of uh, um, in the coastal area because these uh, discovery of oil are actually mostly uh, um, offshore. My screen is freezing, I think. Okay, it's okay. Um, are offshore. So who the people who are affected are mostly um, of uh, coastal communities um, because of uh, the offshore exploitation. And those coastal uh, communities are already impacted by climate change because of climate erosion. As you can see from the picture, many of the uh, the, the the city around the, the around the coast have to move because of coastal erosion that is already here since many years already. Uh, they experience a lot of flooding and other uh, environmental assets linked to to climate change. Yet, because of the offshore exploitation, they will be as well the one that have they, that will be really affected again by 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 um, oil exploitation. Uh, in, in the country. 
So for those communities, next to mitigation and resilience strategy, I think there have been a lot of mitigation and resilience strategy that have been put in place by the state or that have been promoted by civil society organization. But beyond that already, communities themselves were engaged in fighting dirty energy. And I give you the case of the Sendu coal plant project. Uh, of course, these cases have been popularized by civil society in the last, um, let's say in the last five years of last decade. But the beginning of the opposition to the coal plant is by itself a community initiative. Women that have been think that they will be affected by the plant were the first one to just stand and say, we don't need this plant because it's going to destroy our livelihood. The, the Sindhu plant by itself was authorized in 2010. It was co-funded by African Development Bank, the Bank of uh, um, um, West African Development Bank, the Dutch uh, FMO, and a private bank called the Sebeyawo. Uh, they planned uh, 250 megawatts of electric, um, 230 megawatts. They plan to inject through this project 230 megawatts of electricity into the country total 221 production annually. Um, it was expected uh, that uh, it will increase the net production capacity in Senegal by 37 degree, uh, 37%. Uh, and from the official perspective, uh, the why they needed a coal plant, it was to really uh, um, fight against the insecurity related to the fluctuation of a high hydrocarbon prices and to bridge the gap until the electricity production from gas secure, is secured. Remember Senegal have now discovered gas. So the project was to export uh, coal uh, from South Africa and to bring it in Senegal and to be um, use it for uh, the exploitation um, of, of the, the plant, the, the coal plant. Um, but it was located in you know, local communities um, who are the Lebu community, who are like the oldest traditional communities in Dakar. They are basically seen as the owners of the capital city and basically as, as well one of the ancestors of, of the Senegal. Um, and these communities are traditionally fishermen. I think uh, Nimo have met some of them in Kayar already. And um, they are known as the Lebu communities and uh, very uh, strong and in terms of political positioning, uh, some polit position in some political debate and as well engaging in certain issues. Um, and 70% uh, of those populations is, were depending on fishing activity. So they are the first one who said they don't want the brand new project um, because um, of the effect on climate change. Um, they believe that beyond climate change as well, it will affect the opportunities as women fish dryers, uh, it will affect the availability of water drinking and cause them several social and cultural harm because so, most of the uh, cultural site as well, uh, sacred site were in the area where they, they went to plant the, the uh, they went to put the project. So they fought um, against it on the name of the impact on uh, air quality, seawaters, marine environment, and as well the impact on, on land rights. Land right. And what is uh, interesting in this case was that it was started by um, women, fisher dryers women who were fighting against uh, this project in order actually to really stop uh, what the state was trying to do. Definitely, it was, the case had been popularized later on by main civil society organization like LSD, and some of us are as well involved in, in this case on, on different capacities. Um, they started this whole debate at the African Development Bank uh, through the, the plant, I mean, the, how do you say plant? The, they asked to the African Development Bank, which was one of the co-funders to stop by using the um, complaint mechanism. And uh, after three years of battle, the, 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 the outcome had been that 
um, the African Development Bank announced that it will no longer um, support coal investment. Of course, this is just one of the reasons. We believe that all the main campaign across the continents have as well lead to this outcome. But we think as well, this was very interesting as the case was going on in, in Senegal as well. And African Development Bank was very criticized um, by investing in coal and, and fossil fuel generally. In, 2000, in, um, in December, the Senegalese government decided as well to stop coal across the country and to opt for gas, uh, but still the communities are still fighting because we don't see as well gas as being a solution. It might be an intermediary um, solution for, for the state, but it's not something we see as being the solution because we can find other uh, natural um, alternative uh, power, as we call, you, you, can, you will uh, probably call it, like uh, using uh, winds and, and using um, um, the sun and all to generate power. And we are really blessed by those resources and we should think about about it. So some of my concluding remark um, is that the Barney fight against coal in my country at least have positioned the community as being climate actors in the country. Climate actors in the sense of people uh, with no, um, sometimes even with no education, just being aware of these whole problems and really saying we have our word to say about this because it's our life, it's nobody else's life who will be impacted at the first place. And we have to take play uh, to, to contribute to this uh, decision making. And if you don't uh, include that in this decision making and don't hear us, the plan won't happen and the project won't go further. It really publicized somehow the debate of climate change in the country, because in many uh, contexts, climate change, as I said, was just very theoretical and people are not really used to talk about it. On, on It's not a main debate. We talk a lot about corruption, governance, uh, strengthening institutions, but really getting into the deep debate on climate change was not seen as a very public debate. It was debate between expert and all. Um, so despite all this effort from communities, we can see uh, there's still a sentiment that in general, indigenous and marginalized communities are yet to be fully included in international public decision regional and international negotiation of climate change. And that's where really we would like to see uh, us working on to really help this community to be heard, to give the same uh, own narrative of what means development and to be given the capacity to reject what should be, what might really destroy their life or have very negative impact on their life and be given full information about all the potential impact that man, many of the projects that will happen. I think once we get there, we will see another turn in terms of the journey or, or to, for, 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 for a clean energy and, and definitely, Across the, in many parts of the world, communities are playing bigger role uh, in terms of uh, as climate actors. Uh, we have seen, for example, in UK through cooperative, for example, that communities are putting their own money to actually uh, put in place green project uh, or for clean energy in their in their own communities and all we are yet to see it in our context here in Senegal but we still think that communities more and more are seeing themselves as climate actors who have to contribute to this main debate on on climate change so those are some of the words i wanted to say uh, share with the esteemed panel here and um, i thank you